Thank you. Yeah, give her a hand. Give her a hand. And this is the part I really enjoy the most, because I don't have to think about the law. And we have a real special guest among us, uh, Denny Lynch. Denny Lynch has a career this long, this long, and most of it in the wild world of public relations. And therefore, he's seen, he's touched, he's observed, he's reported. And he was also brought to our attention by Scott Kinberg. For it was Scott who brought to our attention the fact that he just authored a book on Olympians. Olympians from Western New York. And everybody will get a signed copy. And uh, if you want, he'll further inscribe it at the end of our interview here. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about his book, the project, and inevitably we will stumble our way into talking about the Buffalo Bills. I don't know how that'll happen, but somehow I'll work it in. And Scott is right here. Scott Kimberg is right here ready at the task because he started covering the Bills the same year. Yeah, and when Denny arrived, <laughs> so did I. So yeah, so uh, anybody's got war stories that we will, I will miss. Scott will have, and Denny, just so you know, this is all on film, and I, we, we know that you've already consented to this, so, uh, by the way, as all of you did, I think you signed all your release forms, right, right, Congressman LaFalse, you, you signed your release form? <laughs> yeah. So, with Denny, without any further ado, Denny, if you want to come up, join me, that'd be terrific. Okay. Denny Lynch. So our Denny, our Jamestown Post Journal editor extraordinaire is a guy named Scott Kinberg. Scott Kinberg has already allowed us how that uh, he started when you started. What was with your the bills, with the bills? With yeah. the bills, yeah. What was your impression of Scott Kinberg? <laughs> <laughs> he was a young guy, went behind the ears when I knew him. Jim Jim Riggs was also involved with the with the uh, Jamestown Journal um, too, and and Scott <laughs> came up. I don't know what that was. Was that your first pro beat? Eighty six, yeah. Eighty six, <laughs> yeah. So I came in eighty six from the Cleveland Browns to join the uh, Buffalo Bills organization, which was reorganized by Bill Poley and the general manager. So um, I met Scott at, at training camp at Fredonia that, that summer, and, and he ended up covering the team for quite a few number of years, traveling with the team and everything. So, But he was just a young buck at that time, you know. So. He wasn't, a, he wasn't a dro drove you crazy about things? He just, it was no, not, not, no, not no stories? Come, no stories no. about Scott? He tried to get a couple extra parking passes one time, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think he had friends coming up from... <laughs> from Jamestown or something, yeah. but yeah. Well, that's the revelation about finding the Ed friends. This is good. Uh, <coughs> so, where'd you come from? What's what's your uh, background? Well, I'm uh, originally from Southern New Jersey. Bring this up a little bit. Um, from Southern New Jersey, a town called Glassboro, which is actually a suburb of Philadelphia, and um, uh, went went to high school and college there. Um, played a little football and baseball. Uh, ended up um, being the publicity person, the student sports information director for the college um, my last year, and that led to a full-time job in sports information at St. Joseph's College in Philadelphia. It's a long story. From there, I um, was lucky enough to be recommended for a job in the National Football League in 1972 with the New England Patriots as assistant PR director. Spent um, five years there, nine years I went to Cleveland Browns when they reorganized. I was there for nine years and came to Buffalo in 86 and retired in 2006. <laughs> wow. Um, as you're going from the, your first day in the NFL, were you awed by all of this? I mean, uh, this is kind of the big league now. Yeah, no question about it. It was a, it was a big leap from uh, being the publicity guy for a, a basketball team in Philadelphia. Uh, they play St. Bon they're in the Atlantic 10. They play... Uh, St. Bonaventure and other St. Joe's College, and uh, yeah, it was it was uh, quite amazing that uh, to go in. We had uh, 
we had a pretty good team at that time. Chuck Fairbanks was the coach, the old Oklahoma coach. We had uh, Jim Plunkett, the quarterback, and uh, Sam Bam Cunningham, a running back uh, that was pretty well known. So we had a, it was a pretty good team. It took two or three years to really get to the playoffs, but it was a, it was a, a good organization. And then, one, then did a uh, new ownership, and then did you find yourself then with the Browns, or? Uh... Yeah, uh, the assistant general manager for the uh, Patriots was hired as general manager of the Cleveland Browns. His name was Peter Hadhazy, and um, that followed with that six months later. Uh, Peter wanted to add a few people to the administration of the Browns, so I moved from New England and to the Browns, and I did a little bit different work. I was a, a team op director of operations, which had to do with team travel and you know uh, charter buses and making sure the fields were lined correctly and practice facility and all that type of stuff, not the real PR um, job that um, I had been doing before. So I was a kind of a middle administration type person. So you're dealing with egos? <laughs> with the pro, with pro right, athletes, please, yeah. yeah. <laughs> pro athletes. Not Scott. No, some, not of, not some, Scott. some of the, uh, some of the head coaches <laughs> were unbelievable. Hank Bulla for one. <laughs> but uh, uh, it, it's been interesting over the years really to, to, to see. I, and I have to admit that I, I felt the players treated me pretty fairly too. I mean, you know, they, they were, most of the guys are pretty good. Some guys have a big opinion of themselves. So. How do you deal with that? I mean, the reality, they come in, they may have seen something you wrote in the press guide uh, or something that went out in the, to the national media, and you may have uh, turned the phrase differently than they would have liked. Uh, they come at you, I imagine. Uh, maybe a little bit, but most of the guys don't read the media guide anyway. <laughs> they kind of, I didn't say they couldn't read. I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, draw your own. There's a lot. <laughs> no, they, but uh, no, they, yeah. There's times when they would say, or they felt like we in the public relations department didn't do enough publicity to get them to the Pro Bowl. It was our fault that they didn't make the Pro Bowl. Not that they missed some tackles or didn't catch the passes or something. But uh, so you know. But it was all right. Over over the years, players are are pretty good. They weren't too bad. Well, it's an interesting piece of the politics because media is incredibly important for the selection process of those things and there's contract incentives to become Pro Bowl uh, and I just always curious behind the scenes at some point the, the Bills uh, I, I'm assuming somebody talks about all right these are the four or five guys we're gonna least hype is that true <laughs> well I get yeah I, I, I think it's a natural thing if Thurman Thomas is your leading rusher, you're probably going to hype him. You're not necessarily going to hype up the second guy or talk about him to the media and things like that. So, um, and we had a, a situation when you talk about popularity. Um, many times the media people get to vote. Fifty percent of the vote is done by, by the news media people uh, locally and nationally. Fifty percent of the, o the other half of the vote is co the coaches, um, the head coaches of the 32 teams. So um, on that media side, a lot of times the, um, if the player has not cooperated with the media, and Scott could, point, could, would know this, uh, or if they were really great with the media, and, and now that I look back over the years, they're the guys that are now on TV because they were good with the media and they could handle themselves, and now they're you know, uh, uh, announcing games or studio shows uh, on uh, national TV. But the guys that were, did a good job with the media were the guys that ended up getting a lot of the votes for the Pro Bowl. Why, oh, he's a good guy, you know, and he's a good player. And so that was, it was an interesting situation. And I always tried to talk to players about, Jay, be respectful with the media, answer the questions. You know, this, they are the conduit to the public. The public cannot know about you if, if you don't talk to them and, or you, you know, tell them to get out of here, that kind of stuff. So it was... Uh, it's interesting, and the good ones, the ones that did well uh, mm -hmm. over the years, did very well, were popular with fans, and are still remembered, are up on the Wall of Fame, and all kinds of things like that. So, One of the guys that's not on the Wall of Fame uh, is uh, Cookie Gilchrist. Cookie you, Gilchrist, who sort of predated you, but not me. and uh, He is on the Wall of Fame. Is he, he now? Two years ago, oh three years God. ago, Mr. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but for a long period Jim. of time, right. Ralph uh, Wilson and Cookie had sort of an understanding that they would agree to disagree. 
Did you come, become part of that in the, the media? Because certainly he was there during the Halcyon days, you know, 64, uh, um, and yet never, he chose not to come back or probably wasn't invited back. He was abs conspicuous in his absence. Did you get caught up in that? Uh, his not coming back in later years. Yeah. Uh, I tried, um, uh, Ralph, we tried to get him back several times, to either to, as an anniversary for some of the teams he was on and stuff like that. And he always said, Ralph didn't pay me enough money. You got to give me $25,000 and I'll, I'll come back for the, for the game. And that wasn't going to work. Um, but I never got turned down by Cookie. So uh, I went to Ralph I, one year. I said, look, I'm going to call him. And I don't really know him. I'm going to call him and, and say to him, we'd really like you to come back. And the fans would love you to come back and whatever. And uh, so I called him. And he was, he was OK on the telephone. But the end result was $25,000 or I'm not coming back. So he never, uh, he never came back. He was never back alive. And they put him up about four years ago posthumously. Um, he deserves to be up there. He was a great quality player for four or five years, uh, at the time when the Bills won the American Football League championship in 64. Uh, he wasn't there in 65, but he was there for the, for the first AFL championship. Funny story, if you want to hear the old story. Yeah. Jack Kemp was the quarterback, and Cookie Gilchrist was the running back. And Kemp, from I, I really never saw Kemp play, but I, the story that I heard was that he chose to pass the ball more than run the ball. And he was not having a great day. He missed some of his receivers and passing. And, and uh, Cookie came back to the huddle and said uh, something like, damn it, I don't want to block. I can run the ball. Just give me the ball. And uh, Kemp continued to throw, the, throw passes in the game. So Cookie walked off the field. <laughs> like, he just walked off the field. And uh, uh, Lou Saban, the coach, said, Cookie, what are you doing? Get back in there again. No, I'm not going back in because Kemp won't give me the ball. So, um, and uh, uh, Saban ended up suspending him from the team. That was early in the 64 season. And uh, a lot of the team leaders, um, including Jack Kemp and Al B. Miller and Harry Jacobs, a lot of those old guys, um, went, to, uh, um, went to Saban and said, we, we can't win without him. He's... He's really the best player we have, talking about Cookie. So the point was that he, uh, uh, he Lou Saban said, OK, I'm going to let him back on the team because you guys really want him to be on. But at the end of the year, he's gone. So at the end of the 64 season, he traded him to Denver. So he was gone after that. That was the Billy Joel. Billy Joel, the big fullback, came in, in exchange for, uh, for Cookie Gilchrist, right? Yeah. And Billy Joel. Had a good year the next year. He wasn't wasn't cookie, but he did have a good year. That was a very good football team the Bills had. So when you just on a side, when you're growing up in New Jersey, who's your team? Philadelphia Eagles. Philadelphia Eagles. I was mentioning before, one of the guys that I saw play was Jim McCusker, uh, Jamestown guy, owns the restaurant, owned the restaurant here. He was with the Philadelphia Eagles when they won the '60 championship. I was in high school and went to that championship game against the uh, uh, Green Bay Packers, and he played and. Quite a few years later, I had a chance to meet him, and I, I said to him, I saw, you know, I saw you play. He also played for the Cleveland Browns, and I actually met him in Cleveland. But he was a, a nice guy when I met him. There was no question. Um, and that's where you can, uh, Randy Anderson, Chicago Sports Hall of Fame, could probably take you to the pub afterwards and see. <laughs> okay. Month later, remember, <laughs> if, you're any kind of, if you're any kind of guy, Randy, that's what I would do. <laughs> so you, you wrote a book. I mean, we, we got sidetracked right away. Uh, Olympic team members from Western New York. Uh, I think it's the first of its kind uh, as a composite. What motivated you to do this? I'm on the board of directors of the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame. I've been there since uh, since when I was working for the Bills, and then since retirement. Um, we have a uh, every year we induct a class similar to the Chautauqua uh, Sports Hall of Fame, and. Um, we have had people nominate, uh, send in, send something into us and say, my grandfather was in the 1936 Olympics, and here's a newspaper clipping. And so I would say, oh, that's great. Well, who else was in the Olympics? Well, I don't know. All I know is my grandfather. And um, I said, we need some kind of a reference, some, something that would give us a list of everybody that has, um, has been in the Olympics from Western New York. Uh, and so another fellow and I, uh, got together and we started putting this together. We, the U.S. Olympic Committee has a website um, that lists the town that every U.S. Olympian is born in. So 
for the born in Buffalo, New York. There were 66 people. Um, that's how we started. And uh, uh, then there are, you know, it could have been, let's just say, Jamestown, New York, Attica, New York, you know, uh, Frewsburg, uh, Clarence, any one of those towns. Um, and we came up with about another 30. So we had, we started out with about 90 people and we were able to expand it to almost 200. So that's, and this is the only, and we're proud of the fact this is the only book of its kind that lists people, and there's quite a few, well, several Chautauqua County people that are in it. Um, a couple that, uh, well, at least one that Randy didn't know about even <laughs> before we put our book out. Um, that was a, an interesting guy, but it's, it's, it's fun. And the variety of the sports, it goes from, um, uh, Archery is an alphabetical. It goes from archery all the way down to uh, wrestling. And uh, in, in each of those categories are um, biographies uh, and photograph in most cases of, uh, of people. This one is snowboarding and speed skating and um, wrestling and uh, uh, hockey. Uh, hockey has, I think, 19 people in there because we put in all the Buffalo Sabres who went to the – went to the Olympics, played for the Sabres, so a guy like uh, uh, Alexei Zhitnik would, would, you know, played for Russia, Dominic Hasek played for the Czech Republic, and we put them in there um, as Olympians from Western New York. So, Over in that corner, and I uh, commend everybody to take a look at it and thank Randy Anderson from the Chautauqua Sports Hall of Fame uh, providing an exhibit of Jimmy Clark. Jimmy Clark uh, was born in Norfolk, Virginia in 1914, moved to Pennsylvania before permanently settling in Jamestown, New York. Attended Jamestown High School. He was an amateur middleweight boxer in the 1936 Berlin Olympics, having won five of six fights in the Olympics, all by knockout, and lost a controversial decision in the semifinals. Subsequently turned pro and fought from 36 to 44, compiling a 53-9 and nine record winning 30 by knockout. He was known as the Jimtown Express and the Copper Express, as well as, and, and he became a member of the Chautauqua County Sports Hall of Fame in 1994. And that's one of uh, many that are mentioned in the book, and for those from Chautauqua, Tara Vanderveer is in the book as well, having just won her, what's that, 1,000th one, one thousand. One thousand win. As a coach. As yep. a coach, mm -hmm. that's unbelievable. Uh, what were the surprises, Denny? You were looking, I'm sure, saying, oh, my gosh. I, first of all, I'd heard of that name, but I didn't know there was a Western New York connection. Well, uh, yeah, there's uh, quite a few. There's some interesting names. <coughs> uh, so one of the uh, big sports, especially in the 30s and 40s and 50s, was cycling or bicycle racing in Western New York. Uh, and so there are um, five or six people that are in the book that went to the Olympic, qualified and went to the Olympics. Um, and one of them was a, a man with interesting and, a, and a kind of a famous last name. His name was Ig Ignatius. They called him Iggy. His nickname was Iggy Gronkowski. And Iggy Gronkowski went to the 1924 Olympics as a, cycle, a cycling uh, racer. I think it was 5,000 <coughs> meters or something. And um, his great-grandson is Rob Gronkowski, who was the tight end for the uh, New England Patriots. Uh, so uh, they're, they're, that family is kind of proud of him that they call him the old man. You know, the old man was pretty good, and he was. He, he raced for almost 40 years in bicycle racing. He used to have a race from Buffalo to Erie, Erie Pennsylvania, you know, on a Saturday go. Oh, that's quite a distance. But he was a physical fitness nut, and he was a, uh, uh, he was a good athlete. Um, and we found, um, we found quite a few. Uh, there were a lot of rowers. Uh, the West Side Rowing Club in Buffalo um, had, uh, has had really a nice big group of rowers who have gone on to row in college and then um, went into uh, the rowing in the Olympics. Two of their teams from Westside Rowing Club, 1936 and 1956, the whole boat qualified to go to the Olympics. So they had an eight-man boat um, and they, they won the Eastern Regionals, whatever, and went to the Olympics. And there's a couple of uh, interesting stories um, involving that if you wanted to get into it. But uh, other uh, there's, you know, uh, we have uh, a nice um, uh, group of people that are um, skiers and snowboarders. Um, uh, Jillian Votley uh, went to the Olympics. Um, Eric Schlopey, the, the Ellicottville connection there. Um, uh, and uh, ice skaters and 
um, a lot of a lot of different people. Tw I think 27 of the people you know, that are in the book are in our Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame. So that mm -hmm. was another place we started. We knew there were 27 because they were had already been inducted, and we found some more from the, the Chautauqua Hall of Fame. That 1936 Olympics with Jimmy Clark was an interesting one. That was uh, Adolf Hitler, and that was it. It was in the Olympics were in Germany, and <clears throat> uh, uh, it was. It, it was quite interesting to see. Um, there's a, a lot of stories out there that Jimmy Clark got robbed for the championship and the decision for the in the final championship because he was black and uh, they, the judges were from who knows where, Poland or something. There were the boxing judges, but they they felt that there was a lot of influence that Hitler wanted. Uh, uh, didn't like the fact that there were uh, uh, black athletes, particularly from the United States. Um, and so uh, the story is that Jimmy Clark probably got robbed out of being the uh, lightweight champion there. That was uh, Jesse Owens, uh, the track guy, and they've written stories about him. Um, um, the, he's from Olean, I can't think of his name. Uh, uh, the runner uh, who they made the uh, Undaunted uh, movie. Um, I, I got it in the book. Zamperini. Tamperini. Tamperini. Yep. Zam Zamperini. Zamperini. He was in that 36 <laughs> Olympics. Um, and so there's some, some quite a few interesting stories there. Have you, have you, but always the case when a book goes out and people read it and they say, uh oh, you missed one or two. Did that happen here? Actually, we're pretty fortunate. We, we have only had one or two uh, people. Um, that responded afterwards. There's a newspaper article in the Buffalo News about this. <clears throat> they listed everybody in the Summer Olympics. This is Summer and Winter Olympics, but in the Summer Olympics, they listed everybody from Western New York. And uh, uh, a woman called up and said, "Well, my um, uncle was uh, was an Olympian, and you missed him. And we did. He was a swimmer. Um, he had gone to Winslow North High School, and his father was from Scotland. Well, he was swimming for Scotland." in the Olympics and we there was no record he wasn't born you know to say a US he wasn't a US Olympian he was a, you know for a foreign country and, we, and so we didn't get him but we made a, a second printing of the book and we were able to get him in there and then uh, Randy and I were talking um, and uh, this the latest edition of this book has um, it's Alex Conti uh, and the other Jay Carney. yeah Jay Carney who uh, we did not have in it uh, I thought that I was able to check Chautauqua Hall of Fame and uh, Niagara Hall of Fame and some of them to check on, and somehow we missed them. So we were able to get them into this latest edition. Um, we were able to add them into it. So, so we're about 200 people. We have a, a list on each sport of what they call almost an Olympian, and they are the people that like went to the national championship but lost. One uh, was a woman uh, skier. She was on her final run to make the Olympic team, and she fell and broke her leg, and so she mm. never made it. Uh, Sue Walsh is a, a swimmer in 1980 Olympics, didn't go to the Olympics because the U.S. boycotted the Olympics um, because of Russia and uh, whatever, so the U.S. team did not go, so she's an almost an Olympian, although she never made it. And um, uh, we have quite a few other people. The last one I'll say is um, Baby Joe Macy, who's the boxer, you might have heard of him, <coughs> He's a pretty good boxer from Buffalo, New York, and the legend is that Baby Joe Macy boxed in the Olympics. No, he didn't. He lost in the U.S. championship, and the other guy, the other heavyweight, went to the Olympics, and Baby Joe did not go to the Olympics, although I guess he went as an alternate in case somebody got hurt, but he didn't box. Um, and so the legend uh, uh, we found out was incorrect. We tried hard to get everybody in there, including that almost Olympian, so that somebody doesn't say, you forgot baby Joe Macy. No, we didn't forget him, and he's not an Olympian. Yeah. So. so you're wearing a ring. You guys can't see this, but uh. it's a Buffalo Bills supersized ring. <laughs> uh, it's, it's 1993, which is embodiment of the Super Bowl uh, trip. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about some of the individuals who were part of that, and if you have a, a vignette or two, and I'm not saying you throw anybody <laughs> under the bus for the sake of a laugh, but <laughs> if you can, that's okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> but I know you kind of came in 1986 with Scott, and uh, Scott came with the same time Jim Kelly came. Uh, and you kind of, you had a plane, you, you were at the same airport together, weren't you? Yes, Jim Kelly 
had been drafted in 1983, but signed in the United States Football League instead of with the National Football League, it was a competing league at that time. He, he uh, was quarterback for, for Houston. Um, in 1986, the uh, United States Football League went out of business. They no longer up, uh, cooperated. So um, the, all the players that had been drafted by the NFL were then eligible for the teams to sign in the NFL. One of them was um, Jim Kelly, the quarterback. Another was Kent Hull, who had been a center with the New Jersey Generals football team, interestingly owned by Donald Trump at that time. Uh, and so, anyway. So this is uh, his second presidency now. <laughs> yeah. okay. Actually, Jim Kelly ended up playing for, uh, for Donald Trump because they, they, that, that last year they kind of um, moved around. And, and uh, so uh, Jim, Jim Kelly and Donald Trump knew each other a little bit. Um, so anyway, back to my story. Um, that, so now there's this thing, Jim Kelly's going to sign a contract with the Bills and come to Bills. That 1985, we had been um, two, and, uh, 2 and 14, uh, record, terrible record. Our season tickets were down to 19,000 season tickets. We were uh, in August of 86 with 19,000 season tickets, worst ever for the Bills. Jim Kelly signs a contract. He flies in on a on a, uh, a private corporate jet, and, uh, and Bill Polian had, had flown to, uh, to sign him. They get, off the, uh, they get off the private jet, and they get into a, a limo, and I was in another car ahead of them, and we went to a press conference in downtown Buffalo at what was then the Hilton Hotel. And um, so Jim Kelly pulls up in this limo, and he goes in, and it was a big press conference, and they um, announced that he had signed, and he did questions and answers and everything. Um, following that, Jim Kelly got back in the limo and went out to Fredonia State. That's where the Bills were at their training camp at that time. So, so uh, Jim, Kelly, Jim Kelly gets to training camp on a, <laughs> in a limousine. Kent Hall, the, the player that ends up being Kelly's center and a, a, an important member of the team, was also in the United States Football League. Um, they signed him the same day, except he flew in commercially to the airport. He always told the story. I had to go get my own suitcase off the, off the conveyor belt. He said there was nobody to meet me there. You know, I, here I am in Buffalo. And finally, he said, a, a, tr a truck pulls up with Buffalo Bills written on the side. And they said, OK, get in. So he gets in the truck, takes a suitcase, and they're going to go to Fredonia. Well, the funny story for that was Kent Ho used to say, Jim Kelly and I arrived at the Buffalo Bills training camp the same day. Kelly came in a limousine, and I came in the back of the equipment truck. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually a true story. <laughs> they didn't have room for him in the cab of the truck, so he rode in the back of the truck. <laughs> Ended up being one of the best players in team history, and on the Wall of Fame and everything, he arrived in the back of an equipment truck. So that was, a, that was kind of fun. Scott Kinberg uh, <coughs> put a wonderful article in the paper last couple days. Uh, memorializing uh, Shane Conlon being signed, uh, Frewsburg, New York, claim to fame, uh, with the Bills and that whole backstory. Do you remember Shane as uh, when he first came to the Bills? Oh yeah, oh, certainly. Yeah, I was there. That was '87 in the draft of, uh, for '87. He was um, out of Penn State. Now, he's a legend around here, and really a legend at Penn State too. And had probably the best game of his career in the in the bowl game that Penn State played in, and. Uh, maybe propelled him into being a number one draft choice or a top draft choice. And we were a bad team after the 86 season. We were 4-12. Uh, and 12. So in, in the NFL, the draft is in inverse order of your, where you um, finish. So the best Super Bowl champion is number 32 in the draft. The worst team is number one. So we, I think we were number six or seven in the draft. And we picked Shane Conlon. Um, you know, linebacker out of Penn State as uh, the Buffalo Bills' um, first draft choice. Uh, he came in. He was a shy guy. He was didn't didn't know what to say and everything else. Good football player, but he was a, he was pretty young too. As I remember, as a senior, he was just 21 years old. So he was he was pretty young even to go in the National Football League. But uh, he developed into a great player. Players used to tease him all the time because he had kind of thin legs, and. Uh, <clears throat> Some of the guys are just merciless in the locker room. I would just, they just tease anybody for anything. But um, <laughs> they would always te tease him as having bird legs or whatever. Because he had a big upper body, developed body, but his legs were 
kind of thin legs, and they made they kind of made jokes out of him. They also did for like Thurman Thomas. He was a short guy, and his body was short. <clears throat> So Bruce Smith gave him the name Squatty Body. That was, it. That was Thurman. And so for the rest of his time, they, they call him Squatty. But I was. So they do that. I got to tell you. I got to tell you a Bruce Smith story because it's Thurman Thomas in reverse. Bruce Smith always thought that <clears throat> he was an educated guy. He came out of Virginia Tech, and he liked to use big words, and he didn't always understand what those <laughs> words were. And he would get into a he would get into a, a, a conversation with somebody, a, a, maybe a reporter or something, and he would, he would kind of use, use a word incorrectly. Or he said um, a couple of things like, you know, well, that's water over the bridge, <laughs> or uh, that's water under the dam. Uh, and then and Thurman and some of those guys were there, Bruce, it's not water under the dam. It's water <laughs> over the dam. It's under the bridge, not over the bridge. And that, <laughs> <laughs> and Nate Owens, Nate Owens, another wise guy that was on the team, <clears throat> he used to say to Bruce, you need hooked on phonics. <laughs> 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 but they were, I, mean, I was part of one of that team was such a great team. They could kid each other and, uh, you know, and, and, and make fun of some things, but at the same time they were a really closely knit team, and that was because of Marv Levy and, uh, uh, but a lot of the quality of the players that were on that, on that team. And, Th those leaders were tremendous. Darrell Talley was a tremendous leader. Kent Hull, uh, Thurman Thomas, another young guy who came in at age 21 into a locker room with almost all veteran guys and <clears throat> was <clears throat> accepted pretty much right away. So. so you're the director of public relations trying to make sure everything sort of has a positive spin in life. How were you feeling at halftime during that Oilers, Bills playoff game? When you're looking at the scoreboard and you're saying, Holy crap, this is not going to be good. What yeah. do I, what's my lead? Yeah. You know. It was, it was kind of tough. They were, they were beating us pretty good uh, that day. Uh, they played um, a, a version of some of the offense that's being played now. Um, and uh, they had a couple little, little wide receivers. They call them the Smurfs. And uh, um, uh, Warren Moon was the quarterback. And Warren Moon was just hitting them for a pass 10 yards here, 8 yards here. They're moving down the field. They score. So I believe the game was, yeah, was 28 to 3 at halftime. And we're kind of, you know, we're down like, oh, boy, this doesn't look very good. And we might make it. And I remember Marv Levy told the told story that um, Frank Reich was the starting quarterback that day because Jim Kelly was hurt. That was another thing. Here we got our backup quarterback playing, and we're getting beat 28 to 3 at halftime. But Marv went into halftime, so he said to Frank Reich, Look, Frank, you know, we, we could still be in this game. We just need to go out, and we need to score a touchdown right away, and our defense needs to, and we can see if we can stop them. And so, uh, and Frank had also played um, at, for the University of Maryland and been involved in the greatest college football comeback in history at that time. He had brought the team back from 30, 30 points down to win in college. So, and uh, so Marv said, well, you know, remember like when you were in college, and, and Frank said, yeah, okay. So he goes out, and Marv said, we go out there, and the Bills get the kickoff, and the, the second play, Frank Reich throws an interception. A guy takes it, takes it all the way back for a touchdown. Now we're behind 35 to 3, you know. <laughs> but we ended up rallying and uh, tied it at 38 and uh, kicked a field goal to, to win the game at the very end of the game. And uh, Houston did us a very big favor. They kept trying to run that offense and throwing the ball and incom incomplete passes which stopped the clock which gave us more time and we got hot and we were able to score a couple touchdowns but if they had had not let us get back in the game we couldn't have won that game I mean we had a great comeback but they helped us too so yeah. so Congressman LaFalse who was right there Denny yes I met him before yeah yep, hi. so he's upstairs uh, touting one of his greatest days in life was uh, having a chance to go to the Super Bowl uh, in Minneapolis. Okay. And he gets off the plane and having had his secretary find some reservations uh, that were way out of town. This, of course, was against the, the Redskins. And the next thing you know, they get on a, a transport and they end up about 20 miles outside of where Minneapolis is. In St. So Paul, was it? And, and all of a sudden they walk into where you guys in the club was 
secreted. You were out there in the boondocks. Yeah, in St. Paul. Uh, you got Minneapolis, St. Paul, the two towns. And we were, yes, we were out uh, out of town to kind of get away from the night lights <laughs> and the, the big city of Minneapolis. So we spent the week out there. And then on Saturday night, <coughs> the team moved in close to the stadium, to a hotel close to the stadium for the game on Sunday. But, you know, you did that for a reason, so nobody would track you down. So here's Congressman LaFalls showing up, <laughs> yeah, wishing you well. We had, you, you like this story. Um, at the, uh, at Super Bowl, that Super Bowl, too. Um, Jimmy, Jimmy Griffin, the former mayor of Buffalo, was, uh, was invited with his wife to go, uh, to, go to the game. And so, um, in fact, we had a charter airplane. Were you on that charter airplane with us, or did you? Okay, we had a special charter airplane was for friends and family, and um, don't you feel good now yeah, that you didn't? Make <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they had, sorry, sorry, I brought it up. They had they had charter <laughs> bus service. You could, you know, everything was taken. They taking your suitcases and everything. Anyway, Jimmy <laughs> Jimmy Griffin comes. He's at the hotel, and I'm standing in the lobby of the hotel after everybody arrived, and uh, about an hour later, and in. Uh, in comes Jimmy Griffin walking in with a six-pack of beer under his <laughs> under his arm. Jimmy Griffin was famous you for. Know I know it's a true story. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, so he's going to go up. He's going to go up to the hotel room with his wife and have a couple of beers. You know, he went out to the package goods store and got beer. He was a he was a some kind of piece of work, Jimmy Griffin. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I'm I, sorry you weren't invited. I'm, you know, <laughs> wish we could. Don't make it up to you. Yeah, I was invited. I turned it down. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah the next Super Bowl, the you're in. The ethics rules. The ethics rules. Yeah, we had a lot of people who, after the, after the, uh, our fourth Super Bowl, um, which was in, what, Pasadena? Was that the last one? No. no Atlanta. 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 Yeah. The next year, there were all kinds of people making plans. Well, next year, <laughs> when the Bills go to the Super Bowl, we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. With with people that actually took home equity loans to have the money to, to travel to our, to our Super Bowls, some people two and three Super Bowls. Of course, you never know you're going to go in it again next year, and then again, and then again. Uh, but in 1995, there were a lot of people expecting, oh, Bills go to the Super Bowl every year, and found out that we, we've never been back since. So. <laughs> Next one they do go, John. They'll <laughs> make right, it up on, to you. You're, you're on, on the, the list. You're on the charter. I'll, I'll make sure that. <laughs> I, I, I became good friends with, with Carl Levy, and then after I retired, one of the things I did at Genesis was lead trips abroad, and Marvin Fran came uh, with us a number of times. Yeah. The first time was in um, November of 2003, and that is when Marv fell on the Isle of Capri and ruptured his mm. quadriceps. Yeah. Yep. Flash forward to 2008, back in southern Italy, I fall and rupture my quadriceps. <laughs> <laughs> but I haven't had as good a result as Marvin has. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, those, those great. So, so give me your best Daryl Talley story. As shy well, as he as he was. Yeah, D Daryl Talley was an interesting guy, um, a linebacker on the team. And uh, he, Bruce Smith, um, owes a lot of credit to Daryl Talley. Bruce Smith played the defensive end with his hand on the ground and rushed the passer. Daryl Talley was right behind him as the outside linebacker. We played a 3-4 defense. And so Talley was the guy that would move Bruce around a little bit, move over this way or go to the outside, rush, or rush to the inside. Not that Bruce couldn't have done it himself, but... Tally would kind of be the traffic cop and direct people around. And so many times, Bruce <laughs> would then be just in the right, right place um, and have him um, <laughs> and, uh, um, make, a, make a big play. But one of the, one of the great um, stories about Daryl Tally was um, Bruce Smith uh, was in a game, and somebody hit him, and he was, he was laying on the field. He was hurt. And... Uh, Daryl Talley it, it was Bruce's best friend. And Bruce is laying on the field. The trainers come out, and they're all, oh, you worried about Bruce and everything? And Bruce is saying, oh, I don't know. I think I'm hurt. I don't know. And Daryl went over to him and said, get up, you big dummy. You can't lay on the field. <laughs> Everybody expects you to play. Come on, get up. And do so Bruce got up and went back in the huddle again. <laughs> but again, they were, they were uh, 
they were very good friends, and, and again, they had that relationship. So, so, so Daryl Towie talked him into it anyway. Well, not too long ago, uh, maybe it was a few years ago, Eddie Abramowski was sitting in the chair you're at. Oh. And he was one story after another. He wrote a book. He wrote yep, a book, yep. yes. And uh, being the trainer for so many years, uh, what's your story on Eddie Abramowski? <laughs> I mean, he's he, crazy stories. Yeah, um, I, you know, I, I knew him as a professional trainer, and he has uh, all the stories that he has are in the locker room and funny things like that. And I really wasn't a part of uh, most of that thing, so I heard stories. In fact. When he wrote his book with a, a sports writer named Milt Northrup, I, I actually helped a little bit in putting the book together. He would say, I think I remember it was, you know, 1968, and we'd look it up to make sure what year it was and who he was talking about, and, but he, he wrote a uh, funny book. But Abe, uh, <laughs> Abe tells the story. Abe, first of all, he, is, he was a pigeon racer. Mm -hmm. He owned, I guess they're called carrier pigeons or racing pigeons, and he had a coop. And you would go out 60 miles and let the let the, the pigeon go, and it would, and then you would time it to get back. And um, you know, so it took six hours to come back from Jamestown or something to to the coop. And uh, they had races, and then whoever whoever bird got back uh, first got in what uh, would win the race. And they did that, he did that a lot. He had some world champion type pigeons that he they were it was a pigeon breeder and all this other kind of stuff. But uh, one, of the, one of the funny parts of stories that Abe would tell, he said, um, a couple of the players in the locker room, they used to call him Mr. Abe, Mr. Abe. So um, he said, one guy, uh, there was a thermos bottle on the table, and one of the players said to him, Mr. Abe, Mr. Abe, how did the bottle know when to be hot and when to be cold? <laughs> Thermos bottle. Okay, that's not so funny. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then if the, if the, your pigeons are going to be racing, do they have like little little racing shoes that they wear when they're racing? <laughs> no, they're going to fly. You know? <laughs> but he had, he had all kinds of stories like that. So, <laughs> but I, I personally, Abe, I, I thought he was an excellent trainer, and you know, um, he got guys back on the field after injury as good as almost anybody and he was you know he was around for 40 45 years uh, he was a good athlete himself out of Erie Pennsylvania and went to Purdue as a football player and got hurt in college football and ended up um, becoming an athletic trainer after that which in those days was not not well known and uh, there weren't a lot of schools to prepare you for it so he studied under quite a few different athletic trainers and he was very very well respected for all his years we, it's easy for us to talk about Marv Levy uh, and his successes, and really he's iconic in our world. But there were a few coaches who probably didn't reach that same level along the way, like Hank Bulla. <laughs> and uh, do you have a good Hank Bulla story? <laughs> well, first of all, Hank Bulla and I went back. When I was first hired in the New England Patriots in, in 1973, the head coach was Chuck Fairbanks. Chuck Fairbanks and Hank Bulla had been on the same college team at uh, Michigan State. In fact, Hank Buller, the, the coach, his grandson just finished up as a linebacker for, uh, for Michigan State. There's like four generations of Bullas that have been, that have been linebackers at, at Michigan State. But anyway, Hank was a good defensive coordinator. Um, and uh, when I came in August of 86 to the Bills, Hank Buller was the head coach of the Bills at that time. And I knew him from when he was in New England. So it was good. I'm coming in as the new guy, and I already know the head coach already. Um, so we get into the first couple of games of the year. Jim Kelly came in as quarterback. So then they started Jim Kelly, and uh, we, had a, we, we won some games, and we lost some games. And um, one of the games, um, Hank was being interviewed by the media, and he said, you know that, that Miami Dolphin team, they just slowed us down. They took the sails out of our wind. <laughs> He was another. He was another malaprop guy. He could really get things. Uh, you know, it was almost, almost like Yogi Berra. You know, that Yogi Berra would make these. You know, that Yogi Berra one like that restaurant's so popular nobody goes there anymore. <laughs> but Hank was a Hank was a good guy. He was a really good defensive coordinator. He was not a good head coach. But that happens to so many, so many coaches over the years. They're a good 
defensive or offensive coach and winning championships. Rex Ryan, when he was with Baltimore, they won the championship as a uh, when he was a coordinator. Then he becomes head coach and didn't really make it uh, successfully as a head coach. And it happens to a lot. Wade, Wade Phillips. Wade Phillips is, it was a Bills head coach and a Denver head coach and was as um, as head coach was. You just have to say basically average, but as a defensive coordinator, he still he was at the Denver Broncos when they just won the Super Bowl a couple of years ago. He's an outstanding defensive coach, right where he should be. Hank Bullis should have been a defensive coordinator. Instead, they they promoted him to a position of incompetence, as they say. He was didn't was just not good enough to be a head coach. Often we'd come back from the Buffalo Bills games, uh, often after they lost, and turn on the radio and listen to the coach. Uh, oh, coach Chuck Dickerson? Yeah. Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I always well, wondered how, the, how uh, you know, after he left, he then, of course, found he was on the radio and was uh, uh, opinionated, to say the least. Uh, how did you guys take that in the media world? I mean, because you had to kind of well, react to that. First of all, Chuck, Chuck Dickerson was a defensive line coach for the Buffalo Bills. Hank, I mean, um, Marv Levy hired him. He came in, so, and he was there during um, three of our Super Bowl teams, so you have to give him credit. He must have been a pretty good coach or he wouldn't have been on the staff. But when we played the Washington Redskins uh, the, uh, in the Super Bowl, the week before, um, Chuck Dickerson made some rather disparaging remarks about the Washington Redskins um, linemen which they were big, strong guys, and they were nicknamed the Hogs. And the, so the Hogs of the Washington Redskins, they were an offensive line. Dickerson was a defensive coach, so De Dickerson is going to have to play against these, the, I mean, the coach against the, uh, uh, the offensive line, the Hogs. Um, but he made all kinds of disparaging remarks and calling them pigs and all kinds of other things and fat boys and all these <laughs> other kinds of things. They heard about it, and... They, they had it all over their bulletin board. You know, Bill's assistant coach says they're fat and all this other kind of stuff. And our, our um, defensive linemen, Bruce Smith and others, were really not happy because they felt that, that the Redskins just got all fired up and really pushed us around that game. We really got, we really got hammered that game in the Super Bowl. That was one of, the, one of the games that we were just mismatched. We played well all the way through, and when we got to the final game, Really, three of the four times went to the Super Bowl. We did not have that great game to, to finish it off. We, it was, it's just too bad. That year, they really, that was um, uh, the quarterback, Mark. Uh, Rippin. Huh? Rippin. Yeah, Mark Rippin, who had the greatest game of his life in the Super Bowl. He did, but <clears throat> they beat us pretty handily. So. I remember I w having gone there and listened to every verse of Hail to the Redskin <laughs> nonstop. That's all it was. <laughs> Uh, Chuck, Chuck was departed there right after that, didn't he? Did, well, did, he left the Bills. Yeah. I mean, basically, because of what he said and got, you know, uh, the players were really upset with him. And so Marv ended up firing him. That's the best way to put it. But he ends up getting on the radio, and, of course, now he's got this axe to grind, and he's a disgruntled former employee and with a microphone. So he was, uh, he was just vicious when it came to talking about the team. And of course, every time something happened, you didn't win the game or something happened that wasn't good, he was just all over it. And he said some very unkind things about Marv and others too. So uh, he's not one of my most popular guys. I, I knew him pretty well, but I thought he just, as I said, became uh, so bitter that it was just, he wasn't even objective at anything. So. Give me your best Denny Lynch story. <laughs> oh boy. I guess, I guess uh, the, probably the uh, 1990 season, we win the, um, we, we have a home game for the AFC championship against the um, Oakland Raiders, or maybe it was Los Angeles Raiders. Huh? Los Angeles, Los Angeles Raiders. I knew they moved there, yeah. And um, we're playing in, in the game, and at the end of the game, whoever wins that game is going to the Super Bowl. So, you know, and we end up winning the game 51 to 3. Uh, it was the largest margin ever, basically, in a, in a playoff a championship game. Well, within two hours, first of all, when we came to the stadium that morning,
the people on the staff had to bring our suitcases with us. That year in Tampa, there was only one week between the game and the, um, between the championship game and the Super Bowl. Now it's two weeks, so you don't have that rush after the game to go immediately. But we, we left on a flight at 8 o'clock to go to Tampa. 8 o'clock that night, game gets over at 4.30. And with our suitcases and everything, we're, we get on. The, this is a, these are five or six of us that went ahead on a commercial flight. And uh, we had to go down to, uh, to Tampa <coughs> and get everything set up, ready for the team to fly in the next day. Uh, so it was it was really uh, exciting and so unusual and everything. And then to have won by such a margin, I mean, by halftime, the game was over. And we're, you know, people are calling up their relatives wanting to know if they want tickets and all this other kind of stuff. But it was, uh, that, 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 was that was one of the most exciting times that I remember. We went three more times, and every time it was exciting, but not as exciting as that first time with just uh, going to the Super Bowl. And then I was, I had to uh, organize press conferences and get things ready in, in Tampa, and you've got the national and international media and all that stuff. So it was, uh, it was quite an experience. How was your feeling when you saw the wide right? I know, I'll just give you my own personal, we were, we were in the other end zone, and we were cocked just enough so that both my partner and I, Marty Idzik, stood up thinking that it was good because of our angle. Uh, only within seconds to have that waved off. What was your what was your experience? Well, just kind of lose your breath, you know. And uh, I mean, uh, uh, first of all, we shouldn't have been put in that position. He should not have been kicking from 47 yards. We had enough time that we could have moved the ball closer to the closer to the goalpost and probably would have had a better chance of of making the field goal. It was on a grass field. For those of you to know, grass is harder to kick off with the ball than it is the artificial turf, which is kind of solid and it, the ball s sits up better. So uh, this is a grass field in Tampa, and he's got to kick 47 yards uh, on a grass field, and it was a little moist too because it had, uh, you know, it was about six o'clock, uh, no, seven o'clock at night, and there had been some dew or whatever, and the grass was kind of wet, and he kicked, then he missed by just a little bit off to the right. But before that, um, we had at least three plays that if we've been able to complete it, um, passes, um, and move down another 10 or 15 yards, I think that the whole course of history would have been changed. But he had to kick from 47. He was not uh, the greatest long-range kicker. He only had made a couple of field goals all year more than 45 yards out. This was 47. And they had all been on artificial turf, not on grass. And just the pressure of the thing, and that ball just went up. And it's a lot of times when he hit it, like a golfer, um, you hit the ball, and the golf, will, the the ball will curve a little bit, usually over to the left, where a right-footed kicker. And in his case, he kicked it, and it stayed basically straight. It never hooked. If it hooks three feet and goes through the upright, it's good. And it didn't. Yeah. So, yeah, we still see that every year at Super Bowl time, and they run that replay again and again and again and they've tried to get a hold of Scott he lives in Petersburg Virginia uh, he's a financial planner uh, and uh, he has never really agreed to uh, or I'll say in the past never agreed to be interviewed he just wanted to be in the background um, but they did that um, that ESPN 30, 30? Th 30 for 30 show and he was he was interviewed he's a high quality person uh, you know, really a good guy. And he, if it wasn't for him, um, for those first two or three years that we were in the playoffs and Super Bowls with the kind of field goals that he made to win games on the last play of the game and all those kinds of things, we wouldn't have been where we were. So the players were very supportive of him afterwards. It was not like, you know, you blew it or something. I mean, they, they understood that he was, how important he was to the team. And uh, he felt terrible. And then we had the rally in Buffalo, and I don't know if any of you remember that, but we come back the next day on the plane and um, we get on <clears throat> charter buses. It had been planned there would be a welcome home ceremony at City Hall in Buffalo. So we knew we were going to go. Of course, we were hoping it would be after a win, but it, it wasn't. So we pull up in the charter buses and everybody, we get walking up on stage with our whole group, coaches and players and staff people, and there's 25,000 people out in the, uh, uh, I think it's Lafayette Square out there or whatever, in front of City Hall in uh, in Buffalo, and it was just an amazing sight. And um, um, 
in Norwood's case, they, they started uh, chanting, Scott, Scott, Scott. So he actually went to the microphone and talked for a minute. Yeah. That was kind of a emotional. I'm seeing you're emotional. <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah, emotional, yeah. It was. Quite, yeah. It was you were watching it. It was amazing. If we draw a little closure to this, and I can't thank you enough, Denny, for coming down and thank sharing you. your book. And hopefully everybody walks away with one. And if you want it inscribed, Denny will be glad to do that. And I want to thank Lakeshore Savings for yeah, making this all uh, available to everybody for, for free. So thank Dan Reinega, should you, should you see him. Uh, your top three Bills players that you had to write about. Well, top three players, um, I mean, you could almost put the guys that are in the Hall of Fame, well, that would be five or six of them, I guess, now, or you can count Marv Levy and Bill Polian, because <coughs> they're in the Hall of Fame, too. But, you know, uh, Jim Kelly, uh, Andre Reed, Thurman Thomas, Bruce Smith, um, uh, who am I miss I'm missing? Uh, Somebody, somebody else, I can't think of it. And then uh, Marv Levy, all the guys that ended up in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, they were the, the special group. Uh, and then you had what, would, what you would call the, the, the players that keep people together. In football, they call them the glue guys. The glue guys are the Kent Hulls who played center, didn't always get a lot of recognition nationally. Darryl Talley, the linebacker, was the guy that pulled everybody together. and. You know, he kept a good spirit and everything else like that. And um, th those glue guys were just so important to making up a, a great team. And then you had like, guys like Mark Kelso, who was an academic All-American and uh, played football at William and & Mary. And he was, he was supposedly too slow to play and ended up being the safety, uh, you know, for the team. And, uh, uh, you know, he was, the, let's call him the smart guy back there because he could direct everything. And, it was, a, it was an interesting group. But I would say that basically the guys that have gotten the most recognition would probably be the, the guys that I remember best. Who of that group has not gotten the recognition that probably is Hall of Fame caliber? Uh, Steve Tasker, the special teams player, I think should have been in there years ago. Um, he was one of the first ever to be full-time special teams and every kind of special team. For, for those of you who know, you got the punter, the punt team, the, the punt return team, the kickoff team, the kickoff return team, the extra point, and all those. They're all special teams. And um, Steve Tasker was on them all, especially running down and making tackles, what they call the gunner. And uh, he, was, um, uh, he was exceptional um, <laughs> and just uh, had many, many big plays. And most coaches say that the team is divided up into three. You've got the offense, the defense, the special teams. And they're all the same value to helping win the, win the game. And special Steve Tasker was the absolute top of our special teams unit. And um, he, should, he should be in the Hall of Fame. Now, you, as, time, as years go by, um, there have been other players that have become, or have been noted as, as special teams players, as great special teams players. So he, he doesn't get the recognition now as much as he did in the uh, late 90s when he should have been put in. Uh, they just don't, the writers, sports writers like Scott, no, I'm only kidding, <laughs> don't like to, that they don't like to vote in special teams players because they don't play, they play one out of every four downs. And the argument is the guys that play all the time should be the ones that go to the Hall of Fame. Not a guy that just kicks the ball once in a while or punts or covers kicks like Tasker did. Um, so there are not many special teams players in the Hall of Fame. But I think Steve deserved to be in there, still deserves to be in there. I just don't know. Unless he gets into what they call now the old timers committee, he may make it because he'll be more than 25 years out of the game. Mm -hmm. He gets into a different category for selection. So, But um, he was an outstanding player, an outstanding person. Another one of those glue guys. I mean, he just kept everybody together and made great plays that got everybody inspired. And, and he, was, he was a great player. So I would teach the one for sure that uh, it hasn't gotten the recognition he could. He was, he was the most valuable player in the Pro Bowl as a special teams player in Hawaii one of the years after the, after the season. Um, he, he gets voted the MVP because he blocked a punt. He returned a punt for like 80 yards for a touchdown. He had a great game, and then he, he gets to be MVP of the game. Amazing. Well, you're amazing, and I appreciate all of your time, effort, and your work product that you've not only provided through the bills and all those relationships, but certainly with this book, which is a one-of-a-kind. Ladies and gentlemen, Denny Lynch.
Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Thanks a lot. That was great. That Thanks. Was great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great. I'll yeah, make sure that's yours. Yeah. yeah that's just, I just put one up. That's just perfect. Thank you. All right. <coughs> Hi. Hi, Mr. Lynch. I'm Sherry. I'm Hi. Hi, Sherry. Yes. Yeah. 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 